So what makes Ashes different? There are a lot of things out there being said about the game known as Ashes of Creation being put together by Intrepid Studios, and by now a lot of people have heard about this game. I know a lot of people hesitate to get involved with games when they're early in development. As you can see, PC Games has said that Ashes of Creation is the bravest MMO in development right now, and it already has a very strong foundation of followers. 500,000 people have signed up for Ashes of Creation, 40,000 people have bought packages uh, with a price tag high enough to get them into the alphas or the betas. So what exactly is it about Ashes that makes it so new, so different, that it's drawing in this big crowd of people? Well, the first thing, the first thing is the world itself. Now, a lot of us have been playing MMOs for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and we know that even in games that tout themselves as sandboxes, like in the upper left-hand corner, that is Arcage's map. Arcage touts itself a sandbox, but you have this very linear progression of where you should be at what level. Now, a lot of times a player needs to make this map, uh, as you can see in the World of Warcraft map, people put together a map of where the optimal place that you should be. Or sometimes the gamers, the programmers themselves, the developers, they put where you should be at what level. Now, this is the interesting thing because in Ashes, we're not going to have towns when we first get into the world. The world is blank. It is a blank slate. And it is truly sandbox because the players are going to develop it. So why is that so unique and different? Well, because in your traditional game, you spawn and then you go around some area. You either spawn in a village or you spawn near a village and you do like level one to six near this like local village. And then you move on to like the, the regional hub, like maybe level to seven to 15 and you do it there. And then it's from about level 16 forward, you work out of the next place. And really sometimes that's it. Sometimes you have your headquarters for the rest of the game. A game I'm thinking of is uh, Arc Age. Once you get to uh, Ostera or Marianopol, that's it. That's your headquarters really for the rest of the game. So how is Ashes breaking that? So here's you. Wait, no, that's me. Here's you, and you've just spawned in the game. Now, where did you come from? You came from a portal. Now, that's their portal, and... One nice thing about Ashes is that at launch, there's going to be four portals, and you're going to come through one of them. Now, if unlike most games where if I play an elf and you play an orc and our friend over there plays a human, usually you've got some shenanigans you have to go through to link up. you got to get to X level. Nice thing about Ashes is there's going to be four portals, but you can enter any one of the four to link up with your friends right away. Now, for all the people that are going to play the Talnar, you don't get to link up with your friends through the portal. We don't know how linking up's going to happen. We don't know if linking up's going to happen, but for the four major races, uh, the ones that are returning, the ones that are coming back to this world that has been untouched by civilization for thousands of years, we're going to get to choose those portals. Now, at first, you got a couple of options for how you're going to approach the world. You're going to quest or you're going to gather. Now, I'm going to go with the caveat right here of other games have allowed you to gather right out of the box, uh, and they didn't quite work out right. Uh, Final Fantasy uh, 14, the original, was one of those. I actually started as a gatherer. Didn't work out well, was not a smart decision. Uh, Arc Age is another one. You can gather right out of the box, but you're limited by labor. We're going to talk about gathering in just a second. We also know that you might not have a gathering tool in Ashes right away. You might need to, everybody might need to do a little questing or killing uh, at first. Then gathering will pop up. I do not want to leave crafting off the list, but obviously somebody has to have done some gathering before he can do crafting, but it will be totally possible once a little bit of infrastructure is there that you can be a, cra a full-time crafter. That is very unique. People are really interested in hearing about that. We're just crafting as a full-time prof profession. So how's it going to work? Well, 
as I showed you, there are no towns, there are no villages, there's no citadels. We know there's some castles, but those are for a completely different mechanic of the game, and you don't go there right away. So you've got this blank void world. Now you show up in the world and you start working in this uh, teal-ish area that's known as a zone of influence. And the black dot inside of that teal area is known as the node. Now at character creation at first launch, no nodes will exist. They will be there, but they won't have developed. They'll all be level zero. So if you stay in this teal-ish area and you quest and kill things, you'll generate XP and you'll eventually grow your node. Now, the interesting thing is, is maybe you didn't stay in the teal area. Maybe everybody rushed to the yellow area. Players are going to shape the world as it develops. So you've got your group of people, and we're just going to assume that you stayed in that teal area, and you did enough stuff. You did enough questing, killing of mobs, maybe gathering. We're not quite sure how that's going to work yet. And you pop the teal area to stage one. Well, now the interesting thing is, is that node is going to exert its influence over all those local areas, that purple, orange, that upper purple, that green. And we don't know if it'd be able to do it over rivers. We, we don't have all the mechanics yet, but this stage one node is going to stifle the growth of all these neighboring nodes. So this is going to become the population center. Imagine that a lot of people now will find out that that node progressed. They're going to go there to get those gathering tools to start those things that a stage one node does. When this stage one node hits stage two, then some of these surrounding nodes will be able to go to one. So as you can see, Ashes is so different because the players are going to shape the world. And the other interesting thing is no two servers are going to look the same. Like I said, on server A, the teal area might go to stage one first. On server B, that upper green one might go there first. On server C, it might be the red one on the side that goes to stage one first. So the players are in control of the world. This is really the first MMO that I know of that is close to release where the players have this true sandbox control of the world. So what makes Ashes Gathering so different? I know that there are an entire segment of MMOers who just like to gather. Now I know some people don't believe me. I love nothing more than just going out, gathering, accumulating resources, making myself rich. Um, I'm stoked for Ashes Gathering itself. You're going to have your traditional mining. You're going to have your lumbering. We know you're going to have fishing. If there's other stuff out there that is gathering, we don't know about it yet. Not quite sure what else you can gather. You've got wood, stone, metal, and fish. Um, so we'll see if there's other gathering professions. But... There is not infinite bag space. I know a lot of people say that they like being able to go out and gather for like five hours. And then you've got like, I hate, I hate this is about games, but you have like 30,000 logs in your backpack. I don't like that. It's unrealistic. There's no fast travel. If you go out there and you gather all up, up all this stuff, you're going to have to get it somewhere. So how does that work exactly? First off, you're going to have your bag, your, just your backpack, and we're going to call it X units. You're going to have X units allowed in your bag. Now, I will say that there are specific gathering backpacks uh, that give you increased inventory for gatherables. We don't know exactly how those work yet. Beyond your backpack, you have a mule. Uh, you can add X times 10 units onto your mule. Or you have your caravan, which is X times 100 units. Now, this is very unique in that if you are out in the world, you can be attacked. If you get attacked, you will drop a portion of your gatherables. Not your gear, unless you're corrupted, and that's not in this video today. But if, you get, if you're out there and you're gathering and you get killed, you will drop a percentage of your gatherables. Now, what does that mean? It means maybe you want to stay close to civilization so you can run back and forth with your backpack only. It means maybe you're going to want to uh, just fill up a donkey's worth and run it back. And then your caravan, you're probably going to gather up all of your gatherables to a freehold or a town. 
And then if you need to get them somewhere to sell, you're going to have to use the caravan system. It is, you are going to have to use it. The caravan system itself, you're going to find them in the wild. Occasionally you'll run into them. You can choose to ignore it. Uh, it's an actual option. You choose to ignore it. You can choose to help defend it. Uh, you see a caravan departing town. You got nothing to do for 30, 40 minutes. You might be like, yeah, I'll jump on board and defend it. Or you might be out there with like 10, 12 of your buddies and see an, a, a weak, undefended caravan and be like, yeah, we're going to attack it. Got to realize caravans are rolling PvP zones. You can attack them and not suffer corruption. There are rewards for attacking caravans. You get a percentage of the stuff. Uh, the disadvantages, people get to know you and know that you're a caravan thief. Uh, there's rewards for defending a caravan. Uh, we don't know what those rewards are yet. We do know that you can sign up for caravan defense. And if you defend it up to a certain point, you'll get the reward. No jumping on a caravan at the last minute. So the world of gathering is hugely integrated into Ashes and gatherers, those Care Bears out there, you are going to have a valuable spot in the world. So again, oh, gatherers, not only are you a viable part of the economic system of the world, but you are going to help grow those nodes and you may be helping grow them faster than uh, just people out there doing quests. So, as I said, we don't know if gathering right at launch, right at walk through the portal, can I start gathering? We don't know if that's going to be possible. It very well may. Uh, those starter areas that we come out of the portal to may have a pickaxe vendor, a hatchet vendor. We Those are things we just don't know yet. So, you've got everybody working in this area that might cause it to pop faster. But those gatherers might go over to a different area that's more uh, lush with resources. So what you might end up happening is that node pops first and actually blocks out that node that a lot of the questers are in. So everybody doing anything, earning XP, is always feeding that node. So the players are in control. No more go from here to there to this other place because those places don't exist. We will be making them. So what makes Ashes crafting so different? Just like I said with gatherers, I know people in several MMOs that all they do is make gear. All they want to do is log in, socialize, talk to people. They're not role players per se. Some of them are. I, I'm not going to talk about role players per se, but they're people who are just very social. They're hanging out in town. They're watching a movie on their side screen, and they're like, oh, hey, can you make me this sword? I got all this stuff. And they're like, yeah, absolutely. I can do that for you. I know people that that's all they do. So what makes the crafting so different in Ashes? Well, first of all, Stephen Sharif, the uh, CEO of Intrepid, he talks to us on the Discord all the time. And as you can see, farming, breeding, cooking, and crafting in general is of extreme importance. He even kept it. Extreme importance in the world. It is his personal opinion that players who control the economy exert greater influence of the world than those who directly influence PvP. And he's absolutely right. Uh, it is fine if you have a, a Zerg of 300 people, but if you don't have a good crafter among them, you will be outplayed by people who are better geared. Non-combat playstyles will absolutely be a full-time option and will yield considerable influence. Remember guys, in this game, there are nodes that are determined by military strength. There are nodes that are determined by religious dedication. But there are nodes that are decided by money. How much money you have, and there are nodes that are decided by popular election. You could be a crafter in probably easily three if not all four of those nodes and be a powerful uh, person be a power player because hey if you don't get treated well by the military node you just pack your stuff up and you go to a new node they lose access to you uh, it's uh, lots lots of value in keeping your crafters happy Recipe paste. No RNG in crafting. I'm so happy about this. I'm so tired of RNG. RNG needs to die a horrible and painful death. Best available. Top gear will be on par with the epic world boss drops. Absolutely. Uh, the best crafted gear will be as good as the best drops. But this dial system, and we don't even have a ton of information on the dial system yet. Nobody has seen crafting except maybe the people at Intrepid, and they certainly haven't shared it with us yet. The crafter gets 
freedom over the stats by which dials they turn when they're crafting. Each crafter will make their gear slightly different based on the dial system. So it's not going to be every level 40 leather worker is making the leather jerkin of Subway sandwiches and it gives you these stats. It's maybe I make my level 40 gear, uh, turning my dials this way, and they're a little bit more strength, stamina related. I'm just making stuff up now, by the way. And maybe that guy over there, he turns his dials a little different, and his are agility, uh, dexterity stamina based. And we know the different social organizations, uh, it leads to access to different dials. So now here's the interesting thing. We know outright we've been told that the Thieves Guild allows some dial turning to increase dexterity on leather armor. But we can guess, we can fathom, we can put our brain cells together that every class can wear every armor style. So it's highly possible that you're going to see the Mages Guild be able to add uh, intelligence or spirit onto leather armor because that's what casters need. So right here, crafting in and of itself, we could we could theory craft for hours and hours on just crafting, but we know that Stephen has said it's going to be profound. It's going to have a profound impact on the world. And so that's it today, guys. I wanted to try to just sum up the three big areas, uh, how the world is going to be different, how gathering is going to be different, how crafting is going to be different, and put that together. Really trying to draw more people into more Ashes discussions. Uh, most people have heard about Ashes already. If you haven't, uh, I invite you to sign up for Ashes uh, using my referral link. If you don't want to use my referral link, just chop off everything after the com and go and sign up. If you are one of the people that signed up and my numbers aren't reflecting properly, uh, let me know and we will talk about that offline. All right, guys, and that's it. Uh, this is all the ways to get in touch with me. I love talking to people about Ashes of Creation. I probably spend one to two hours a day uh, hanging out with people, talking about them, uh, showcasing stuff to them. Uh, if you want to talk, you can email me. Discord's the easiest. I'm on Discord all day. Uh, I stream a lot. I stream regularly on Wednesdays and Fridays. No matter what game I'm streaming, I guarantee you Ashes will get talked about at some point. So drop on by. And then as always, big thank you to my sponsors uh, at Patreon. Uh, these guys help me do some giveaways. Uh, every dollar that the Paradox Gaming Network brings in goes right back to my fan base. So I do giveaways. All the Ashes money that I get from referrals will all be doing, I'll be doing giveaways once Ashes goes live. Anyway, guys, I'm going to go into post-production. I want to get this out. I want to talk to a lot more people about Ashes. So make sure to uh, join us, join the Ashes Discord, uh, and make sure to sign up on the website. Take care, guys. Hey, where are you going? We're not done yet. See these videos? This video is up here to watch. You gotta go over here. Hit the chibi. Subscribe to the channel. Check out the webpage. And I'll see you guys on Twitch.